Okay, so now what we're going to do is, if we finished glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and the citric acid cycle, we've mostly produced NADH molecules who are carrying electrons, but not really much ATP. So now we're inside the mitochondria. This is the area called the mitochondrial matrix. And this is where the next bunch of reactions are going to happen, and, and then the process occurs. So what we have inside the mitochondria, we said there's these two membranes, the, the outer membrane and an inner membrane. And, and these are both phospholipid bilayers. And then we have a, a space here called an intermembrane. I'm going to write over here, though, because other stuff will go there later. Uh, intermembrane. Base. And this would be the cytoplasm out here. Just so you can kind of get a feel for it. Cytoplasm, space between two membranes, and then the matrix that's inside the mitochondria. Cells have many mitochondria, not just one. And depending on the type of cell and how active it is, uh, it could have many, many mitochondria or few. You now, fat cells, they would have very few mitochondria. Muscle cells have a lot of mitochondria. So you get a difference there. So what? happens in this process. The NADH, who are carrying electrons, right, I'll try to use this other a little bit brighter, carrying two electrons that they receive from glucose or some other part of the process. They're going to give those electrons to a membrane protein. So this is a protein embedded in the membrane of the mitochondria. And then what's going to happen, get a better color to see, is it's going to use the energy from these electrons to pump protons. So these would be and protons and hydrogen ions, so H plus, same thing, because remember, the element hydrogen is one proton, one electron. Remove its electron, it's just a proton. And it's also technically a hydrogen ion, because it's an ion of that element. So H plus also means. P plus, or pro, which is a proton, same thing, essentially. So the energy from the electrons going from NADH, and this is just going to go back to NAD plus, the energy from those are going to be used to pump or push protons in this direction, from matrix to the space, not out to the cytoplasm, but the space between the two membranes. For every one NADH, molecule, this particular protein, so these green little blocks here representing proteins, membrane proteins, they're going to pump three protons across the membrane. But that's not the end of it. Those electrons are going to get passed along to something else. So there's going to be another molecule in the middle here who's going to grab hold of the electrons, not pump them, but it's going to pass them along to another protein. That protein will do the same thing as this one. It's going to take the electrons okay, and use the energy from the electrons as it passes them along to pump three more protons. So from this space into that space. And then there's going to be something in between here, another intermediate molecule, that's going to pick up the electrons from this protein. And it'll give them to a third protein. And that third protein is going to do the same thing. It's going to use the energy from the electrons to pump three hydrogen ions or protons into that space. And then the electrons are going to go from that protein, the end here, to oxygen. And this is kind of an important part. So in this part of the process here, what's going to happen is oxygen, if you remember back when we talked about elements, was very electronegative, meaning it had a strong pull on electrons. It pulls electrons like a magnet, and it's very strong in the way it does it compared to other elements. So what we have here is oxygen pulling these electrons really from the NADH to oxygen, but they're moving through these proteins to get there. And the proteins are using the energy from the NADH to act as active transport pumps. They're going to pump, push, just like a water pump could pull, pull water from underground, 
up into your house. Okay? That requires energy. Energy comes from electricity, which is the flow of electrons, actually. And that is the same thing that's happening here. It's just happening at a cellular level. So electrons are flowing from NADH to oxygen. When oxygen picks up these extra electrons, it actually combines with some protons and then forms water molecules. The important part here is not to fixate on the formation of water. The important part here is to fixate on the role of oxygen. You all know that you need oxygen to survive. All living things require oxygen. Except some that are anaerobic, which is just not, sorry, not another story you can get into later in the course. I'll talk about some anaerobic organisms. But organisms use oxygen, but when you're asked, what do you use oxygen for? Like, why do you need oxygen? Some people will think, uh, say things about red blood cells and all, but red blood cells are just carriers. They just help the oxygen as it goes from the air, from gas, into the liquid of your blood. So, and then they just transport, but then what does it do with them? It doesn't just, you don't just need it to just be there. You need it to do something, to carry out a job. What's its actual job? What's the job of oxygen for a living thing? And this is the answer. This is it. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. So that's what we're looking at here. The ele oh, well, I'll have to rewrite it. I already wrote it over here. The electron transport chain. That's what we're focused on here. And that's, that's what this is. This is a, a chain of proteins. So a sequence of events where electrons go from NADH, from one protein, to the next protein, to the next protein, to oxygen. And then that's it. So it's the final acceptor. It pulls them through. If you don't have oxygen, if oxygen isn't here, then there's no pull. It's like missing the magnet. So then nothing moves. It's like kind of changing the a slope. You know, you have something like this and, and a ball would roll downhill, but flatten it out and you just put it there, it's not going to roll. And that's the idea. Energetically, if these things are moving to oxygen, but you remove the oxygen and it's kind of like you level it out so that these things won't happen. They don't occur without oxygen. Right? So we have to have oxygen to be the final electron acceptor and allow this process to occur. Now, these things all have names, have technical names, which is usually more for more advanced courses. This one, this one's name, you know, it, it, it's helpful and it's, it describes what it does. Um, it's called NADH, dehydrogenase, which means it dehydrogenates or removes look, the hydrogen from NADH. These things also have just numbers. So sometimes this is referred to as complex one, the Roman numeral one. Second one is referred to as number three, though, complex three, and this one's referred to as complex four. So it's the one that's called complex four, also called cytochrome oxidase. That's this thing, cytochrome. Um, the, the intermediate uh, takes the electrons. Uh, it oxidases it and gives the electrons to oxygen. So this protein as well is the main one that interacts with oxygen. So in your bodies, in your mitochondria, what actually interacts with oxygen it's this one here, so this complex four, so maybe take extra note of that because that one is very important because it interacts with oxygen. This one's really important, it interacts with the NADH. The other, there are other ones are important too, without them the process stops, but these have other unique and important parts to them. What's happened here, okay, is that one NADH, allowed nine, protons to be pumped, right? Three, six, nine. Where's the ATP, right? Not here yet, still not there, but we'll get there. Okay. So remember, now we have a ton of NADHs, right? Glycolysis, we gained two. Pyruvate oxidation, we gained two. The citric acid cycle, you gain six. Starting to add up, that's 10 NADHs. Okay, so that'd be 90, you know, of these. You're, so you're pumping a lot of these protons. And what's going to start to happen is you're going to get a, a huge difference in the concentration where the hydrogen ion concentration, remember that, in this area is really high compared to this area. So this area here inside the matrix of the mitochondria, hydrogen ion concentration is going to be low. So what is going to, wants to happen is that 
these protons are going to want to get out of this space. They want to get out of the inner membrane, and they're going to want to either go out into the cytoplasm or back into the matrix. So somewhere, somewhere that's not this area where it's really high concentration, high energy, unstable, all those sorts of things. Nature, it's organized, so low entropy, actually. So nature doesn't favor this. It favors them to move out of the space and disperse more. So when they do, it's going to release energy when that happens. There's a protein that allows that to happen, and that protein is embedded in the same membrane as these. It's not part of the electron transport chain. Many people have that wrong in books and pictures and talk about it in that sense. It doesn't do anything with electrons. It doesn't transport them. It's not part of it. It's separate from it, but related to it. Okay, it's just called an FO transporter. Okay, so this FO transporter allows protons to simply diffuse from high concentration to low concentration. They just go back into the mitochondrial matrix. So that seems at first to just defeat the purpose of everything we just talked about, right? It's like, okay, so you broke down all these sugars, you can get energy for electrons so that you could pump these protons, but then after doing it, the protons just diffuse right back to where they were. So what's the point of that? Well, the point of that is that this protein is then joined to another protein, who's an enzyme called F1 ATP. So what the F, I'm going to erase some of these things, so um, just so we have more space here. The F1 F1 ATPase can bind to it phosphates, just phosphates like that, and ADP molecules as substrates, and it can then put them together and make ATP molecules. That process is going to require energy. So somewhere this enzyme needs energy. Well, it's going to be coupled with or joined to the FO protein. So we call this then collectively the FO, F1. ATPase. Two separate proteins. This one by itself can't make ATP. It needs energy from somewhere and it doesn't have anywhere to get the energy from alone. This one will allow diffusion of protons, but it can't make ATP. It is, it's not an enzyme. It doesn't have that ability. It's a membrane protein that allows transport. So collectively, though, the two forming a larger complex then work together. And so in the membrane here, the energy from the FO is what's powering, or the energy from the proton flow through the FO is what's powering the production of ATP. What's going to happen, it's going to take the diffusion of three protons or three hydrogen ions to then make one ATP. So one, two, Three protons go through, that's enough energy to smash a phosphate into an ADP molecule and produce an ATP molecule. And that's kind of the whole was the whole point of really all of this. Is how do your cells make ATP? You need ATP to survive because proteins do work in your cells. And for the proteins to do that work, they need some energy source. Sometimes the energy source could be a concentration gradient. So concentration gradients are ways of storing energy. But most of the time, the most ubiquitous source of cellular energy is this molecule called ATP. So cells have to make lots of ATP to carry out all sorts of different jobs. Where do they make it? Mostly in the mitochondria, you can say. Mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell. Yeah. But what does that mean? It means that's where they make ATP. So then we ask, how do they make ATP? Will they have an enzyme that makes ATP? Doesn't it cost energy? 
Yes, it does. Well, where does that come from? It comes from diffusion of something. So diffusion of something from high concentration to low gives off the energy. That's often referred to as, there's this process called chemiosmosis you see in a lot of books. It's not my favorite term because the term osmosis is a very specific term for the diffusion of water. That's fusion of water is osmosis. That this doesn't involve water like at all. So it, it confuses people. It's diffusion. It's diffusion of protons. Proton diffusion from high to low concentration. It's a coupled reaction or energy coupling. It's basically taking energy from diffusion and coupling it with that of a chemical reaction, putting these things together. So it's a, it is a lot of different things, um, but it's not diffusion of water, um, which is not involved at all. So don't get confused with that term because I, it confuses people because you learn one thing and then someone else tells you a different meaning for the exact same word. Um, so I would say ignore that term and just focus on what actually happens here. And that's what I just explained to you. So what is the FOF1 ATPase? It's a combination of two proteins that together make ATP and almost all the ATP for the cell. So of those 36 to 38 ATP that are made, you know, it's going to make really, you know, 34 you know, of those ATP coming from the energy from the NADHs and these FADH2 molecules. So a question some people have is why is there some why is it not one number? Why is it two different numbers? And that's because 38 are the number that are actually total made. So these 34 plus the four more, like two from glycolysis, two from the citric acid cycle. So that would equals 38. However, in eukaryotic cells, in our cells, remember the pyruvate? Or pyruvate oxidation was out in the cytoplasm. And so to continue at the end of glycolysis, it had to get into the mitochondria, which means it has to be transported into the mitochondria. In addition to that, there are NADH made out in the cytoplasm, in glycolysis. They have to be transported into the mitochondria. The concentration of pyruvate isn't that high in here because it's immediately oxidized. But the concentration of NADH is high. There's a lot of NADH in here. So typically it costs energy to bring these in. And so because you have to use up some energy in our cells and in, in eukaryotic cells, we typically use the number 36 just to factor in that it, there was some cost to that process. But bacteria don't, they just get the full, say, 38 because it's they don't have to deal with this. They don't have mitochondria. This would be the bacterial cell membrane in a bacteria. And this would be a cell wall in bacteria, and this would be a space in between them. So bacteria do the same exact thing, just do it in a slightly different way, or the space is a little bit different. So hopefully that explains for you what is the electron transport chain. A group of proteins that are active transport pumps, pumping protons, getting their energy from electrons, coming from NADH and then giving the electrons to oxygen. Their job is just to pump those protons and when they're there in high concentration, they wanna get out. So they diffuse back into the matrix and that diffusion gives off the energy so that these two proteins together make ATP. And that's kind of the conclusion of it. That's how cells make ATP molecules.